Remember that as a believer priest, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He's a great teacher of the Word of God in John 14, 26. That not only does he teach it and settle it or record it in your soul, but he applies it to your life. It's called teach and recall. He teaches it and then recalls it. What a wonderful idea that is. I mean, how many times have you been in a situation and needed the Lord and needed his help and wondered how you could make a prayer to get his answer because he answers prayers? And the Holy Spirit just recalls uh, it to your soul. And uh, that happens a great deal to you if you're a spiritually advancing believer. So what you have to do, you can't study the Bible in carnality. It's not a book of the flesh. It's a book of the spirit. Confession of sin would be necessary if you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. It is called the gospel according to Paul and 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. If you believe it, then you're saved. And that, that would be a key to you. And so uh, 1 John 1, 9 says, if I confess my sin or if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. That word cleansing is, goes back to verse 7. It deals with the blood of Christ and what is, what is provided for you as a believer that is in sin. You confess it and you're restored to fellowship with the Father. Fellowship's the name of the game. So let's have a word of prayer. Mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue, and avert sin should be identified in your own personal life and confessed or named in silence and privacy through your priesthood. And then we'll study. And so, our Father, we thank you today for these that have come with us to study the Word of God. We're in the antediluvian period, a period that history, recorded history, knows nothing about unless they study the Bible. <coughs> unless they study the Bible. And there's nothing like being present in ancient history in a dynamic way by reading the Bible. What a wonderful thing that is. And we look at the antediluvian period because it's the period of Adam to Noah. Ten generations of believers that are some of the great stories that we tell children as we bring them up in the Lord. Some of the great children Bible stories come from the antediluvian world. There are many don't believe it ever existed because it's not part of human history recorded history, but it is. And so we've been studying it. I ask, Father, that you would bring the reality of it. What purpose is it to me today in 2022 to read that? I mean, what purpose would it be? Make that clear today in this message in Jesus' name. Amen. Here we are in Genesis, the second chapter, and we're looking at verses 8 through 14. And it's a really interesting passage because it deals with the geography of the ancient world. There is no other history, there is no other history, recorded history, out of the post-Diluvian world, the world you and I live in, where you have this information, unless you have a Bible in the library. I don't know if they still have them, but one... I came out of the north to go to UAB uh, in preparation to go to dental school. They had a Bible in there. I checked it out. I didn't mean I checked it. I mean, I actually put my John Henry down and took it home, read it. Didn't read the whole Bible, just read the four, four Gospels of it. Just to find out if Jesus was more than a curse word. <laughs> uh, my whole life, Jesus Christ was swear words. So I, when I got to the South, everybody kept talking to me like a real person. I went, I don't know about that. So I checked the Bible out. You would have to have a Bible to know anything about the ancient living world, the world of Adam and Eve all the way to Noah. Ten generations of believers are recorded that existed in that period. I can tell you that I had a professor in biblical history in my theology days it didn't believe it existed. <laughs> In fact, he believed all of that was mythology. Everything of that nature was mythology. And um, 
It didn't matter that I found places in the New Testament where Jesus referred to him as literal. That said a great deal to me about what he thought about Jesus. But uh, Needless to say, we'll say, and that young people ask me, well, why did you keep going there? I'll tell you why. After a degree. When I was at Western Michigan, I had a professor who didn't even believe in God. Why didn't I leave the school? I was after a degree. <laughs> okay. Well, here we go. Verse 8. In verse 7, we have that God formed man out of the dust of the earth. In verse 7, and breathed his nostril, Nisha Mahaim, the breath of lives, plural in the Hebrew, and the man became a living soul or being. Once man is born, uh, created into the world, and that is the whole purpose of chapters 1 and 2, is to get man in the world, Isaiah 45, 18. The Lord planted a garden, verse 8, the Lord planted a garden towards the east in Eden. So we know that was a real location place. And we know that he planted the garden, and therefore this famous garden in the Bible is called the Garden of Eden. Okay? <clears throat> like he planted a church here in Moody. <clears throat> the Lord planted a garden towards the east in Eden, towards the east. So always keep your eye on this idea of towards the east. Towards the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground, the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing in the sight and, for, and good for food, the tree of life also in the middle midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's important that it was in the middle of the Garden of Eden which was located in the east, in Eden. Verse 10. Watch this now. This is really important. Now a river flowed out of Eden. That's one river. Flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And from there it divided and became four rivers. Now watch. The name of the first that flowed out, the first river was the one, was the well that was the water was coming from, agreed? Yes. From Eden. Then four rivers, it divided into four. The name of the first was Pishon. It flowed, watch this now, around the whole land of Havilah, where there's gold. Ain't God good? Ain't God good? You thought it was at Fort Knox. And it's, it's at Havilah. That's why you don't have any. It's at Havilah. The gold of that land is good. And then he goes on to mention stone. Uh, you know, a, a very precious stones. The name of the second river is Gishon. It flow. Watch this now. It flows around the whole land of Cush. We got, we got two rivers flowing out, right? Got one river, and out of that one river, we've identified two flowing out. Agreed? And they formed one of two things. They've either established peninsulas or continents. You understand that? Okay. The name of the third river is Tigris. Watch this. It flows east of Assyria. 
And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, the Euphrates is really uh, interesting in further discussions uh, out, outside of the antediluvian world, like Assyria is. <clears throat> All right? So I want you to look at the geography with me of importance of the antediluvian world. And you say, why is that important? Well, here's one reason. <clears throat> is because the ark flowed somewhere out of the east of Eden, not the garden, right? Because he's expelled from the garden. Adam was. So when we get to Noah, right? We get to Noah. That ark is somewhere out there, and it's going to flow, it's going to float, or however, boat, however boat maneuvers in big storms, and it's going to rest on the Mount Eret, Eret, which is a great marker in the ancient world. It was the highest mountain in the world, of the ancient world. And the rest of the world was destroyed, except for that mountain. That mountain is a is a a marker of God's enormous logistical grace. Because the flood has gone across the entire world. It's covered all of the mountains with the exception of one. And that mountain was preserved to dock the ark. God good. Listen, God will do that with your ark you're riding too. It's called God's logistical grace. Write this, write this down now. Philippians 4.19. That's your verse for the same thing. My God will supply all of your needs according to the riches of grace of his grace in Christ. This is a part of the story that's often missed. When they come out of that ark, the only sense of bearing that they had was to look off from the mountain. But they could, and they could look north and south and east and west. To do what? To get their bearing. It's a marvelous story, and it's true. And it's absolutely 100% true. So we're looking at the only historical record of the antediluvian world and what a marvelous world it was, like all worlds that God designs, and is one worth reading for your benefit. In 2 Peter 2.5, and I wrote part of it on your paper, Peter referred to this period, the antediluvian world that I call ADC now on your paper, as the ancient world. He called it the ancient world in 2 Peter 2.5. The ancient world before the flood. We live in the post-Diluvian period of a world after the flood. It, uh, just go to 2 Peter with me a moment. Go, go to 2 Peter. Let, let's look at something here. Let me show you what Peter says. 2 Peter Second chapter. He, he writes, Peter writes, how God didn't spare the angels in verse 4 when they sinned. That's Genesis 6 through 9. And then he says in verse 5, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, family, born again when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. 
Then he goes on to talk about other, other condemnations of God. Right? Let me see something else here. I'm in 2 Peter, so go to the third chapter. Go to the third chapter with me. And start, let me, let me, because listen, eschatology, you understand eschatology? Eschatology in theology is a re reference to the second coming of Christ. We call it eschatology. The, la the, the, the study of the last days, eschatology. Now watch what, he, watch what he does about the second coming of Christ, because we know he came the first time. He came to the post-Diluvian world, after the, the world after the flood. He died on a cross, was buried and raised from the dead, and sent it back to the Father in the third heaven. Now, watch, watch what Peter, watch how he connects eschatology. Watch how he connects this stuff. Verse 3, knowing this first of all, how important you think that idea is. This is why I teach the Word of God to you. Knowing, knowing, knowing what? Knowing the scriptures and your dependence on them to understand where you are in history. Do you know where you are in biblical history? Where he says, I want you to know where you are in biblical history. Knowing this, first of all, that in the last days, which we live in, the coming of Christ, the first coming, Mockers will come where they're mocking, following after their own lust. In other words, they, they, want, they, they want to live their way and no other way, and I don't want anybody telling me anything other than that. Those are mockers. And we live in a society today filled with these people. You can't tell them anything because they know everything. And it's not something they're going to be... These are adult people. These are adult people in America... Beyond the age. And here's what they say. Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. That's where we are in our study. Watch this now. Watch this now. For when they maintain this, that false thinking, do you understand? Well, he, he said he was coming, he hasn't come, so apparently that's wrong. They, it is, watch this now, it escapes their, their, their notice. It escapes their notice of an important doctrinal principle. That by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water. That's Genesis 1, 2, and 3, 4. Was formed out of water and by water. And through which the world, that water, the world at that time was destroyed. Remember, water was dropped from above and below. Being flooded with water. Now look at verse 7, because now he's walked you out of the creation story of Genesis 1 into the New Testament of eschatology. Watch this, verse 7. Look at verse 7. And this is your place in human history. Today, this is where you are in, in biblical history. By his word, the ancient world came and the present world came. By his word, the present heaven and earth are being reserved for fire. Not water. That, that deal's over. That's the antediluvian world was destroyed by fire. The post-diluvian world will be destroyed by fire. And as well as the millennial. By his word, the present heaven and earth are being preserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly people. That's the story of Noah and his generation. Isn't that interesting? 
See, I find it interesting as a teacher, two key ideas in there. You need to know, that's how, this is how that subject opened in verse 3. Knowing all this, don't let it escape your notice. This is the day in which you live. You live in the last days when scoffers and mockers of the word of God tell you that it, that how could that possibly be true? I mean, why hasn't he come back? He said he's coming back. How come he hasn't come back? You know why? Watch this now. You're still in 2 Peter 3? Look at verse 9. That tells you why he hasn't still come back. Verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Why do you think, why do you think Noah preached 120 years in, while building the ark to tell people this is a boat for you to get on for your safety? A judgment is coming upon the world, and the only place you're going to be saved is in this ark. And listen, you can't get on the ark unless you're born again. Think about that. And they listen, everybody rejected the idea. 120 years. Well, where's it coming? I don't see nothing. Where's this water you're talking about? Where's this judgment coming? About 120 years. And why 120 years? It wasn't something that Noah picked out. It was something God picked out. He gave them 120 years after they went on God. Because of why? Because of verse 9. He's not what? Willing that any perish, but all come to repentance. A change of mind about the object of your salvation. These men... We're talking eschatology all the way back to Noah's day. He used it as a reference point, didn't they? They used Noah's flood as a reference point for the second coming of Christ. Now, do you suppose that's, do you suppose this lesson is relevant to your life? It's a marker point of history. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So don't, don't let that slip by you. In Hebrews, I'm right close to it. I'm sorry, I'm going to grab Hebrews 12. Uh, Hebrews 11:2. He says, faith is, in verse 1, he says, faith is assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith. That's the faith cycle. You got to have both sides of it. You got to have the conviction and the assurance side. That, listen, and where does that come from? It comes from God. It doesn't come from life. It doesn't come from your experiences. It comes from your faith in God and his word to your life. Look at verse 2. For by it, what's the it? Faith. Yeah, thank you. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. See, that's Peter talking about it, third, second, third chapters. So that what is seen is not made out of things which are, which, so that what is seen is not made out of things which are visible or seen. See what I mean? I mean, well, then what's it made out of? Listen to me. The Word of God. The Word of God. The Word of God. I mean, how important is the Word of God to you? Yeah. Listen, you use your credit card every day more than the Word of God. That ought to shame you. You're on your cell phone more than you are listening to God. That ought to shame you. That you don't spend enough time with God. You don't spend enough time with His Word. 
And yet, when you, every time you get in a straight, you, you cry for that. Listen, you got to walk it out. You walk by faith, not by... You suppose that's just a one-time deal? Or is it a consistent deal? It's a consistent deal. You got to walk this thing out by faith. What's that mean? It means having a relationship with God that's important every day, every mile of your life. Why is that not your MOS? Modus of, of operation. Why is that not there? It should be. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God, then you got to walk it out, right? You got to believe it. And then you got to walk it out by faith. You got to walk it out. You got to hear it by faith. You got to believe it by faith. You got to apply it by faith. And then you'll watch God show up and show out. That's the most exciting part of faith to me is watch God do the impossibles in my life that I'm struggling with. I'm struggling with, the, I'm struggling with the impossibility. You know, we think we'd be all right because I can do the possibles. I need God for the impossible. You need God for both of them. Well, I hear people, they come to me and they they, or they send notes to me or they tell somebody to tell me. Why is he teaching this stuff? I don't see any relevance to my life. My, 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 listen, everything I'm teaching you is relevant to your life. Let me get you three points and we'll, I'll give you a cup of coffee and a donut. Jesus explained the relevancy of the antediluvian civilization. He did it in Matthew 24, 37, among many of the New Testament references. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. The coming of the Son of Man, that's Messiah, will what? Hmm. What did he actually say? What did he actually say? What did he say? J just like. <clears throat> now, is he emphasizing something? Huh? He's saying, don't read, listen, you need to read the fine print as well as the bold print of your contract. <laughs> is that? Just like. Words like that are important. The days of Noah, you know what the days of Noah is? Tenth generation of the antediluvian world and the last one. When he says the days of Noah, listen, we could have set them for ten generations. This is the days of Adam. This is the days of Seth, right? But he said the days of Noah, because these are the last days of the, the last days. Say last days. Last days. These are the last days of the antediluvian world. Do you live in the last age? Do you live in the last age? The last days. Yes, of course you do. Of course. And he, he tells you that. He said, just like it was in the day, so it will be in your days. We live in the post diluvian world of the second coming of Christ, right? He's going to come. These are the days, right? These are the days. In the Matthew 24, 39, he goes on to say, they did not understand, talking about the antediluvian world, they did not understand it escaped their notice, Peter said. They did not understand until the flood came. Listen, and then it was what? Because what had happened at, at the ark? The door was shut and sealed. Shut from the inside or the outside. They did not understand until the flood came 
and took them all away. Mr. Farmer used to preach one of the all-time great sermons on evangelism on this story and went through a whole liturgy of people on outside of that ark trying to get in. That was quite a... That, I, did. I tell you, when that old boy got ready and gave an invitation, people got saved. But he, he covered all kinds of people. I, I don't know where he got all that information from. Uh, sleepless nights, I guess. But he used to have a wonderful sermon on all the people because, and he read that passage, outside the ark. You do not want to be on the outside of the coming of Christ. You want to be on the inside. And he, he went through a whole, oh, I mean, I even want to get saved again. Chuck Farmer. Noah preached the prophetic gospel and God's judgment for 120 years, which are called the last days. To everyone who would come and see what he was building. Every time somebody, a crowd would gather, and they gathered quite a bit apparently, for 120 years watching him build this crazy box. And talking craziness like it was going to rain and uh, it was going to lift this art, this this boat up and this boat's going to go be and you better be on the inside of it. He pre preached it. He preached sin and judgment. You know, can I talk to you just a moment? Sin and judgment. They go together. You do know that, don't you? In a believer's life or not in a believer's life, it works different. You, 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 you continually stay in sin, he's going to discipline you. That's just, he's going to bring judgment on your life. For what reason? Because he loves you and he wants to correct your behavior. He wants you to, be, to live compatible with the, with the will of God. Agreed? Let me ask you a question. This bothers me. I mean, I came out of a world of flesh and sin and stuff. Man, I wasn't, I wasn't born of a, of a virgin. All right? Flesh and blood and sin nature and all that stuff. What attracts you? As a believer in Jesus Christ, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, which is the power over your flesh, fleshly desires, what is it about the attraction of sin that would cause you to give up that for one moment of a day, let alone a day, to go to that sin and, sin and judgment. What attraction? Now, everybody's got their own answer to that. I've learned that over the years. What attraction could there be from leaving Christ and the power system over life to go back to something that is dead. Sin and judgment. The world of dead men bones. What possible attraction do you have, especially when you know when you go over there and do that, you're going to get sin and judgment, right? You're going to get sin in judgment. You're going to get sin in discipline. You need to read Hebrews, the 12th chapter. You need to read Hebrews, the 12th chapter. See, I don't know. Everybody's got their own answer to it, right? But there's no reason to do that. Why would you ever do that? What, what, what possible attraction? Because whatever is attracting you to go do that is a lie. It's a deception and a lie. God says, stay where you are. And whatever you're looking for that over there, I'll give you so much more over here, right? So why would you do that? And the church is full of them, and mine is no exception. You make these choices all the time. You choose. You choose to leave righteousness and grace and light to go to a world, a domain of darkness, of sin and judgment. 
because you've been lied to and believe it. You've believed a lie. And when he's through with you, prodigal son, you will know that you've been lied to, not by God, but by the world system. The prodigal son, the wonderful thing he did was come to his senses about his relationship with his father and chose the father over the world. You've got to learn to do that. Whatever you're being attracted to go back into sin and judgment is a lie. It will not give you what you're after. It will leave you more miserable than what you left to go get it. When he's through, he'll make your life miserable. You should read Luke 15. I tell you, the church of Jesus Christ has got to come to their senses. They've got to pay attention to what they know to be true and then to embrace it. God will give you whatever you're looking for in the world. He will give it to you much greater in righteousness than in sin. He's not, you're not going to get what you think you want out of sin. Sin is an empty promise of fulfilling what you want in your life. It's an empty promise. you got to quit doing that. The only person that can keep you to stop doing that is you, volitionally. you got to say, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to follow the way of the world and flesh. I'm going to follow the way of God and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in you to give you the power over the flesh. Galatians fought. Write this down. Galatians 5, 16, and 17, and start practicing that. Because we're in the last days. This is not a time for foolishness. We're in the last days. We're in the fourth quarter, and the clock is ticking. I hope you understand that. Point number two. Just to be sure that other generations of believers would understand the importance of the gospel of Christ and God's judgment to those who reject it, it became a soteriology marker for the urgency of the gospel, like 2 Peter 3.9, as well as other passages. Listen, I find this interesting that you missed. In 2 Peter 2.5, it says, it escaped their notice that God didn't spare the ancient world. It escapes their notice that God is a God of judgment as well as a God of, of grace and righteousness. It escapes their notice. Escapes their notice. Well, God and Moses, God had, God had Moses record it with the antediluvian civilization as an example to the future generations of the coming of Christ and God's future judgment. It became, listen, it became with the coming of Christ what was soteriology information became eschatology information. Think about that. I don't think, think about that. That's what I've been talking about. Soteriology, the study of salvation, became the study of the last days, right? Yeah. We're in the last days. We're in the beginning of them. Eschatology. Point number three. In Genesis 2 4 through the fifth chapter in verse 32, Moses recorded the messianic descendants of salvation. Watch this now. Write this down in your paper somewhere. Genesis 5 and Genesis 11. They are the, they are the books of redemption. The, this is the book of redemption in the Old Covenant. These, this is the book. It, the, the Israelites referred to this as the book of life. After the coming of Christ and Him dying on a cross, being buried and raised from the dead, it became, listen to me now, 
it became known in the book of Revelation as the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. The recorded history of redeemed believers recorded in the book of life takes you all the way in the Old Testament to Jesus Christ, and then that book becomes the Lamb's book of life, and everybody on the other side of that is recorded. You and I are recorded in that book. You understand that? How, you say to me, Ron, how do you know that? I do, I do, I do know that. Okay? That's a good question. I ask it to myself. Look at this, Luke the third chapter. Luke the third chapter. I'll show you where, where it comes from and where it stops. Right, once you get it, Luke third chapter. Now on your paper, when you, on your paper, I didn't, I don't think I wrote this on your paper, so. I want to show you this. We have a book going, the book of life is going from Adam, oh, write this down, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. There's a first Adam and a last Adam of, of redeemed history. 1 Corinthians 15, 45, there's a first Adam and a last Adam of redeemed history. Agreed? Well, that's what Paul says. All right, now, watch something. Look, are you at Luke 3? You got Luke 3? All right. Look at verse 23. We have Jesus. When he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being as was supposed, not really, the son of Joseph, the son of Eli. Then he, then he starts to list, right? Watch this now. That's the last, he's, Jesus is called the last Adam. Are you with me? 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Watch this now. You with me? So we got Jesus. Now, we don't have anybody beyond Jesus, right? No. All right. Now, right, just, let's go to the very last verse. Luke 3, last verse. I'm not going to go through all those names with you, because then you would go to sleep and I couldn't get you back. Third chapter, last verse. The son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Are you with me? So we go from the first Adam, man, right? We run our genealogy all the way to the last man, Christ. In the Old Testament, they called this list of people from Adam all the way to Jesus, their names are recorded in the book of life. Like this. Do you understand that? These are the Messianic lineage seeds. Now there's more people. They're just giving you a reference point. These are kind of people that make the hall of fame of faith in Hebrews 11. But when Jesus Christ came, and this is called the book of life of, Is of Israel or the book of life uh, of beginning, the beginning, the beginning book of life. And, and we have these all these names recorded, right? These are the, when it comes to Jesus and the church, the name of the book changes. Revelation, the 20th chapter, verse 15, it's the Lamb's Book of Life. And if your name is not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life, boom, right? Like a fire. Because that's it. When you get to 20 chapter of, of Revelation, 15 first, you're at the great white throne judgment. You know, verse 10 through 15. You know who set this all up? God Almighty, didn't he? Set it all up. Listen, in this whole world, the fact that you have a personal relationship with God Almighty through the Holy Spirit and through Jesus Christ, His Son, the fact that you have an intimate relationship with all three members of the God in the church age, the last, the last age of the human race, is enormously important. You should, you should honor that in your life. 
Nobody else had that privilege like you do. Every believer in the church age gets this privilege to have fellowship. You, re you should read 1 John, the first chapter, and pay attention to the word fellowship. God wants to have fellowship with you. And you can have fellowship. No other, no other group of people just born through the blood of Christ could ever have had a personal relationship with God, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. Nobody. You're the most privileged people in the whole wide world. And you should honor that privilege. You should honor it in your life. What you have and what I have is an enormous thing. All right? Another doctrinal truth, I've got point four. Another doctrinal truth taught from the antediluvian world. You say, why should I study this, Ron? What relevancy is there to my life in 2022? I'll tell you one. God is faithful. <laughs> If you learn nothing else, God is faithful. And when Luke came along and wrote all these names from Adam to Adam, right? From the last first Adam to the last Adam. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the faithfulness of God that none perish, but all comes to salvation. And how do you do that? You've got to believe that Christ died on that cross for your sins and judgment eternally. Was buried and raised from the dead. Not only does he take away your death, but he brings to you a life. The power of the resurrection is the power of the life of God. He takes away the sin judgment and he brings you life righteousness. It's a gift, both. He gives you life eternal and he gives you grace, righteousness. A position in Christ that is forever. And you should honor that. You should honor it. You should be proud of that heritage. You should wear it as a bat of courage. We learn 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1 9. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Fellowship. Fellowship with God Almighty. You know what? Well, you know one of the great things of fellowship, and I'm going to close with this. You know what the great thing of fellowship is? Prayer. I. 1 John 5, 14 and 15, I can call him any time of the day, any hour of the day, he takes my call direct. And if I ask anything according to a will, he hears me, and if he hears me, he will honor it to my life. That's fellowship with God. And he will show up and show out. So Father, we thank you today. For lesson one. Pray when we come back, Father, we will take a look at this in lesson two. I pray, Father, that we could walk away from lesson one and have some ideas down on our paper in our life that says, I ought to live for Christ and not for myself. Why would I go back to a world, a domain of darkness, sin, and judgment? when I've been rescued by the grace of God out of it and placed into a position in Christ that gives me all the benefits of sonship. Why in the world would I ever make one choice like that? I pray, Father, you'd put on our hearts the importance of this. We are in the last days and our life counts. Our testimony to Christ counts. It counts towards those that when judgment comes, while they are living, it will be miserable. They will be on the outside of the ark and not on the inside. We all need to be sharing that with people.
the day of judgment is coming, and it is coming quick. And we need to be a people with that message as well as the grace message. We need to have the message that Noah had. The righteousness of God or the judgment. Take righteousness by grace. In Jesus Christ.